Okay, so we are live. Everybody, welcome back to another exciting installment of the Open Worm Journal Club. Um, we are joined today by four folks uh, making up our panel to look at this uh, paper focusing on muscle cell and the connection between the neuron and the muscle cell in the C. elegans, and we'll be talking in general about how uh, neurons stimulate muscles. Um, our larger purpose uh, in the Open Worm Journal Club is to educate um, and to provide a basis for doing computer modeling of these pieces and parts. Of course, in the Open Worm Project, we're dedicated to creating the world's first virtual organism, and that means translating biology into simulation in computers, and that requires a combination of folks that come from the biology side as well as folks on the computer side. And so our panel today is reflective of folks coming from the biology side and folks coming from the biophysics side and folks coming from the computer side. And our whole purpose here is to get everybody to kind of just start to talk the same language. Um, so um, we're really grateful for everybody joining us. Uh, so let's just do a quick round of introductions and then we will get on to the uh, material at hand. So let's start with Abdullah joining us, uh, unfortunately, without a video feed today. But uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Abdullah, and I'm in, in Karachi, Pakistan right now. And I'm sorry I, my connection is not good enough to turn the webcam on, uh, okay. but I am represented by the picture of David here, <laughs> who does not represent me completely, by the way. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, I've been contributing to C302, which is a sub-project in OpenWorm since the last three months. Yeah. Excellent. Good to have you here. And Emma? Hi. Um, and, uh, I'm in San Francisco. Uh, I am a former biologist, now software developer, and I'm interested in sort of applying modeling to biological systems. Excellent. Great to have you. Audrey? Uh, hi, I'm Kadri. I'm uh, in Barcelona doing a PhD in, uh, in C. elegans, actually. But I'm mostly also interested now in um, how brains function and uh, yeah, how kind of everything comes together, so that's why I'm here. What? And Vahid? Might be on a bit of a delay. Okay. Hello. There we go. Yes. I'm from Iran. I'm working on uh, the modeling. Do you have my voice? Yes. Just a delay. Okay. Good. Sorry, my connection. I think the problem with the delay is that. He'll start speaking, and then I'll start, and I'll go. Oh, we can't hear you, and then that'll be right in the middle of him speaking. And so, so apologies for the delay, but um, uh, yes, but at least we're all here. Okay, great. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, start the presentation. Um, and again, uh, please feel free to jump in and ask any questions. Also, if you're watching us online. Um, I'm going to have the Q&A box open. Um, if you go to the Google Plus event, um, you can ask questions there as we go. Um, I'm going to try to look at the uh, other uh, social media feeds as we go here, um, but may not get to some of them towards the end. So if you have questions, um, apologies if I don't get back in, in super real time. OK, so we are looking at this paper. Um, we're, we're learning about how to attack the muscle. We're going to do it in the context of the C. elegans. And um, uh, so it's this paper here, Rated Synaptic Transmission at the Canarabiditis Elegans Neuromuscular Junction by Lou Hollowpeter and Jorgensen. This paper is um, about uh, six years old now. Uh, came out in 2009. Um, but before we go into the details of this, I do have a couple of sort of high-level generic like orientation slides that I wanted to show. Um, this is a lovely uh, animated GIF uh, illustration um, by someone named Eleanor Lutz. This is actually her Twitter handle here in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, definitely recommend you check out her stuff. Um, this is a picture actually demonstrating, um, you know, in one animated GIF, the whole process of transmission at the neuromuscular junction. Um, it's looking, in this case, at the example of a human muscle. Um, so there's a few things that are actually different uh, when it comes to 
the elegans, but I thought this was uh, too good to pass up, and uh, and I thought I would just sort of show it. So um, it, it it shows a few different elements. So one, if you if you were thinking about this as a muscle cell in your in yourself, um, first you'd have to locate your bicep, uh, and then you'd have to realize that that sort of that big chunk of muscle that you have is actually um, a whole bunch of muscle fibers, and each of those muscle fibers, when you go and look at them, is made up of a whole bunch of muscle cells. And then, so we're looking at just sort of one muscle cell. So the same thing that we're going to be looking at today is not so different from one little tiny cell in your own bicep that uh, is responsible for making your arm move. Um, and in fact, all of the motion that you have, uh, every, everything you do in terms of any movement that you make is all uh, facilitated by this process. So millions and millions and millions and millions of cells are uh, responsible for every motion that you are making. And this process that we're learning about here basically happens you know, billions of times in your body in a given day. So it's um, pretty relevant. Uh, so we don't think about it all that often, um, but it's uh, it's pretty important. And if this whole process didn't work, um, we uh, we'd be in big trouble. So um, okay. So then, what it's showing down here is if we've oriented ourselves on one cell, basically um, what happens in a in 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 the neuron. So some neuron, which uh, you know comes out from processes in your brain, eventually literally has to physically come down and touch. Uh, a, a given uh, muscle cell, and um, and in that physical connection, there's this thing called the synaptic cleft, which is the gap between the neuron and the muscle itself. And as uh, an electrical stimulus comes down the axon of the neuron, and it hits the axon terminal, which is the end part, the last part of the uh, of the neuron. That's why it's called the terminal. Um, it uh, causes uh, the release of neurotransmitters. So these little spheres that are here in the end are these little packets of molecules. So we're down so small, we're talking about little spheres that, that hold up about you know, you know, 30, 40 molecules of, of a uh, special kind of chemical that flows across the, the synaptic cleft. And on the other end, it comes in contact with uh, special receptors that um, act like a little keyhole to the lock, or a, a little keyhole to the key uh, that is the molecule that's uh, going ac across this cleft. So as soon as um, the other side here, as soon as the muscle cell sees the neurotransmitter coming at it, um, these special ion channels or special receptors um, cause a change in the uh, membrane potential across this cell. And then, um, so, so there's this electrical change in the muscle cell itself. And that kicks off this process um, inside the muscle cell. Now, if we go inside the muscle cell, we can see that there's this pulling that keeps happening every time the signal comes in. And so that's directly related to the changing membrane potential of the muscle cell. So in fact, there's these other little molecules in here we we're not going to spend too much time talking about, but they literally these molecules literally uh, walk along um, other molecules and, and cause actual physical force, all pulling together. So, you know, when, when this little muscle cell uh, pulls, it's like um, it's like a bunch of uh, rowers, right, in a big ship that are pulling individually against you know the against the water, and uh, all those little motions of those little rowers all added up together is what causes this cell to to pull just a little bit. And then adding all that up, um, since all these guys are all replicated, you know, millions of times inside your muscle fibers, then they all are responsible together for causing the muscle fiber to pull, which causes the muscle to pull, which causes your arm to pull. So at the end of the day, um, it's really a very multi-scale system. Um, it's uh, all the result of little molecular machines that are down here pulling on little tiny strands, but it's all added up millions and millions of times until you get... Um, you know, this much larger force that's able to pull a whole arm. Um, and this is also showing down here a mitochondrion, which is, you know, one of the organelles that are inside the cell, and um, it's also, um, you know, a, a lot of this is the result of calcium moving around inside the cell, which we also won't spend a ton of time talking about, but uh, that's, um, but uh, basically energy is used up uh, that uh, the mitochondria is helpful for um, in, the, in the pulling of this, uh, pulling of this muscle cell. So uh, any questions from our panel or comments on this or any, anything folks want to add to this?
Okay. Um, well, so one thing I want to say then as well about this process is, so this is what it looks like in humans, and it's pretty similar in C. elegans, except that um, in the C. elegans, there's this big difference in what this neuron is doing. First of all, the neuron doesn't have these things here, which are called myelin sheets. Don't worry about them, but they're not, they're not really present in the, in the neuron. Another thing is that in the C. elegans, um, the muscle cell actually reaches out to the neuron. Um, so the muscle cell actually has a little arm that comes out and it touches the neuron. It still has this little terminal, but it, it's kind of built into the built into the axon of the cell itself. It doesn't kind of protrude like this. The muscle is the thing reaching out to the neuron. Um, and then the last thing that's different is that um, in the neuron of the human, there's an action potential. So there's an all or none act activation. Um, and, uh, and it's the same thing in the muscle. But in the C. elegans, the muscle has the all or none um, uh, potential. But the neuron doesn't. The neuron has a graded potential, and that's and we're gonna and that's gonna be a big key part of this um, paper today. Is that we're going to be looking at um, we're looking at the differences uh, that are caused by a neuron that isn't all or none, isn't causing the action potential, but in fact it stimulates the muscle a little bit more every time it's more activated. Um, so a few key differences there. But other than that, a lot of this process is is very similar, and I think this is illustrative of what we're looking at today. Okay, um, the next thing I wanted to show, um, so this is actual C. elegans muscle. Um, and uh, there's a little YouTube video I just uploaded to the YouTube channel recently, um, or just earlier today. I um, actually would like to have this thing loop, but I think I can just loop it by clicking this. So um, this is, you know, much less attractive and colorful. Um, so I'm going to loop it a few times so you can see what's happening here. Um, but uh, what I want you to focus on is a couple things. So one is that up here in the upper upper part of the screen, there's um, a glass pipette. This thing here is uh, is basically sticking through um, the scene. This is looking through a microscope down uh, into C. elegans muscle. So this is a, a probe that's been stuck into the muscle, and the muscle cell is is here. Actually, there's a, a bundle of about three muscle cells that are here in the middle of the scene. So you can ignore the stuff that's kind of in the bottom half of this picture, okay? But there's actually like about, so there's a muscle cell that's here and kind of diagonally cutting through. There's another one that's up, up at the top, diagonally cutting through. And then this pipette, if you follow where the triangle, where the tip of the triangle goes, it's stimulating a muscle cell that's kind of in the bottom here. Um, so it's, this is the bottom edge, and then um, it slices through here like this. So what's happening is that... Um, this pipette is actually stimulating this little muscle here to pull. And what happens in the scene is that it starts um, relaxed, and then um, about in the middle of this movie, it pulls a little bit, and, uh, and it contracts, and then it relaxes again. Okay? And, and so you can see the time scale this is happening on. This is, um, this is some data from a different paper, Gao and Zen, in, in 2010. Um, and, uh, and so you can sort of see how it's, how it's working, just, just in, in black and white pulls and then it relaxes. And this way of, so this is an experiment that you can do. We're talking about a very, very tiny, tiny little cell, talking about 10 micrometers. Um, this is actually a pretty challenging experiment to do. Um, you're basically, it's like worse than putting a, a thread through a needle head. It uh, requires very precise manipulator to get down here, but this is the kind of experiment that uh, we're actually, that, that the authors of this paper had to do to make this possible. And uh, through this pipette, you can both stimulate uh, the neuron, but you can also record, or excuse me, you can stimulate the muscle, uh, but you can also record from the muscle. The C. elegans has um, four quadrants of body wall muscle cells like this, so we were looking at like a collection of three or four of them, and you can see how they kind of um, alternate back and forth as they go down the line like this. So if we were looking at about three or four of them like this, then they kind of chain together um, as they go up and down the, the length of the of the worm. This is looking at as if you took the worm, uh, looking at the top of it, and sort of made a slice down the middle, and then you kind of unwrapped it. You'd see these four nice little bundles of muscles as they go down like this, and each one of them individually um, uh, pulls um, and causes the bending behavior of the, of the worm. Okay? Um, all right, so then I wanted to say a little bit about the experiment. So now, um, now going more abstract a little bit, um, so one of the key things to understand this paper is what's going on um, in the terms of the recording and what's going on in terms of something called optogenetics. 
So first with the recording. So as you saw from the movie, basically now I'm representing the muscle cell as this um, red uh, cylinder here. We've got a pipette that's sticking into the muscle itself, and that's actually plugged into an amplifier that lets us record the difference in electrical potential inside and outside of the cell. So we're going to be looking at a lot of traces in this paper that are basically just what we recorded from this pipette. Um, we're also able to stimulate, by the way, um, and some of the experiments will do that. But a lot of the stimulation is actually happening in a second way, which is the result of optogenetics. And this is the part that's important to understand um, for um, the experiments. So um, we think about these little ion channels that are, that are responsible for changing the potential of uh, the muscle cell as kind of like these little cylinders that are sticking through um, the, the, this uh, oval that's uh, representing the muscle cell. Um, and of course there's like you know, hundreds of thousands of them in a given cell and, um, and they're much smaller than I'm showing here. But, um, but the important point to make is that um, a big, a big uh, revolution in neuroscience in the last 10 to 15 years has been created by the ability for us to take these ion channel, take ion channels that are going to open and close being, um, after being stimulated by a special frequency of light um, as opposed to um, being stimulated by some neurotransmitter like we saw in the, um, in the animated GIF in the figure before. So this is a key part of, of how this experiment works is that they've actually got these special ion channels. They respond to light. So this is so light is a much easier way to stimulate a, a cell to change its potential than to have to poke it with uh, you know with a glass pipette. Um, and um, so what we're working with here, variously inside this paper, are cells that have been um, that have had these special ion channels placed inside them, um, and then it serves as a way to do a lot of these experiments that we're going to be talking about. Um, and um, and the uh, the key. So how do you get? So how do you do that? How do you get um, special channels into a cell inside of a living animal? Um, well, you could maybe maybe you imagine that uh, we put the pipette in and we and we uh, put them into the cell, you know, directly by kind of like um, you know pumping them into the cell. Um, and uh, actually, that's not the way that, that this works. Actually, um, because the C. elegans is an animal that we know its genetic code for. Um, what we do is that we're able to actually, uh, we know the DNA that creates these channels to begin with. We're able to make a special worm that when it grows up, it, uh, it makes, it reads the um, genetic code of this uh, ion channel and it puts, it, it puts these special ion channels into its own muscle cells as it grows up. So what's needed to do that is you need to actually create a mutant worm where you've taken a little strand of DNA that creates these ion channels, and you placed it under what's called a promoter, under the special sequence of uh, DNA that creates the muscle cells, or that's that, that are activated when a muscle cell starts to um, starts to grow, and uh, and that uh, it reads over. It's, it's like it's got a whole laundry list of ion channels and other proteins that it's supposed to make, um, and uh, this special mutant worm has this new genetic strand in it that it doesn't normally have and it creates these light sensitive channels just where you want them. And so you grow up the worm and now suddenly you're able to uh, stimulate this uh, muscle cell uh, just using light um, and you don't have to stimulate it using the pipette. Um, so uh, Kadri, did it, how did I do with my very gen generic uh, description of genetics there? Um, Kadri is our, our uh, geneticist. Well I guess, and, and I guess you probably did some genetics work as well on the microbiology side, right Emma? Yeah. Yeah. So how did I, how did I do? Do you guys want to add anything there to my non-genetics expert background and description of, of optogenetics and how that works? Uh, well, uh, maybe I would add that. Um, well, everything was uh, clear to me, but uh, just to make sure that the people um, understand that it's uh, possible to express this uh, construct that we inserted in in um, particular cell types. So for example, what we wanted to express it in muscle, so we can just put this uh, muscle specific uh, promoter. So make sure that uh, only muscle cells then express this, um, uh, the, the, the light uh, sensitive uh, protein. That's right. That's right. Good. Anything, anything to add to that, Emma? Uh, no. Okay, cool. 
Yeah, and so it's important that we're doing it in, in different cell types because um, in the second figure of this paper, uh, when we go look at it, um, we're going to be doing the same thing, but instead of muscle, we're going to be putting it in neuron, and that's an important, uh, important distinction. Okay, cool. So that's, that's, that's key for understanding how this works. So, um, so then to go one step further um, on this, so what, what do you see when you're looking at the uh, amplifier? Um, so basically, um, you've got these ion channels, you've got this muscle cell, you've got this electrode, and what you are reading from the amplifier are these um, traces that come out that show you the dynamics of the cell itself. And I um, pulled this, this figure still out of a different paper from Boyle and Co. in 2008, which we're using in the muscle modeling project. So we're, we're you know, in, in Openworm, we're trying to get these dynamics reproduced as faithfully as possible. So we care about you know, how these dynamics look because we want to make sure that our simulation does pretty much the same thing. And so um, there's two different ways to, you know, record. Um, one is by looking, um, by holding essentially current constant or changing current specifically and looking how voltage changes. And uh, on the other side, it, you can hold current constant and, or you can hold voltage constant or, or change voltage specifically and see how current changes. Um, and so those are called current clamp versus voltage clamp. Um, these are, you know, things that uh, folks called electrophysiologists have been doing uh, for a while to kind of see the, these different electrical patterns. And uh, the important thing to note here, and we're going to see this throughout these papers as well, is that um, these figures are kind of uh, collapsed in a special way. Um, so what you see here is um, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines, and they're all overlaid on top of each other. Um, so this picture um, is a composite from... Uh, multiple experiments that have been run, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, seven different experiments that have been run all um, in sequence, um, and then this picture is sort of showing all of those at the same time put on top of each other. Um, so, um, and it's intended to show you the difference, um, the different kind of trace that you get depending on the kind of stimulation that you put in. Um, so there's a lot of figures that are like this. The y-axis here is voltage um, measured in millivolts, and then of course there's time, um, this little bar here is showing you the time in, in milliseconds. So, and then what, what's different, so down here there's this little key that shows you the different stimulation pattern that's happened. Um, so in this case, uh, the current, so 700 pico amps, so that's a measure of current, um, is 700 is the top here, and um, every one below it is like 100 pico amps less. And so basically what you're seeing here, what, the way you're interpreting this is if I is if I um, scale up or down on the current uh, when I'm recording from this muscle cell, um, this is what the traces look like, um, you know, different, um, with, with different kinds of stimulation. And uh, over here, it's a similar thing, but in this case, the y-axis is current, so this is in nanoamps, um, time in this axis, and here I'm changing the millivolts um, in a step function, and I'm seeing what the response is in different, in different cases. So, uh, so that's important just so that you get yourself oriented to the kind of experiments that we're doing. We're going to be looking at a lot of traces like, like this that are either looking at current. I think most of them are actually looking at current instead of, instead of voltage, but we, could, we can kind of look at either in these experiments. Okay. All right. So this is the first figure from the actual paper that we're looking at. Okay. Um, and so this is figure one. Let me orient you here to what's going on in, in the beginning. So often in these papers, uh, figure 1A is just showing you the very simplest thing that is possible to, to demonstrate about the experimental setup. So there's two traces here. Um, one is the stimulation protocol, and the second is uh, what's happening in current. So um, same thing as what we've set up here. We're recording from our, or here, recording from our muscle cell, and uh, we're stimulating with light. And so the, the trace on the top is what's happening with light. Basically, we're stimulating the muscle cell that has this, uh, these optogenetic channels. We're changing the stimulation at this point, which is causing the current to change pretty dramatically, and then we're turning the light off, and, uh, and uh, the, the, the current trace is relaxing back to where it was before. Um, in this figure, we're just doing it in a very small little pulse. Um, so here we're holding it for, it looks like, about a second, um, and this is what happens, and here we're, we're doing it as a small pulse. Um, so at this point, we're not looking at a synapse at all. Um, we're going to do that, you know, in, in the future figures. But this is just showing you the baseline of what does the muscle do by itself. Um, and this is important um, for us, you know, in the project. We're, we're building up a whole model of muscle, so um, we should be sure that our muscle model can at least do this. 
um, when it's stimulated at the degree that uh, you know that this uh, that uh, these optogenetic channels are doing. And this also demonstrates that their experiment is working. So you turn on light and something changes. Okay, check. Um, we're actually able to record from this muscle cell that everything looks good. Um, time scale is about what we would expect. Um, what's happening down here in B is um, what's called, called a paired pulse uh, protocol. So in this case, um, we're not just doing, so here this is, a, this is a single pulse in this experiment in the upper right here. If you imagine that we do this and then we take a second pulse, okay, then the current is going to go down and then if we put the second pulse pretty close by, the current is going to go back, back down um, and then, but maybe it's not, but, but the question is, is it going to go down to exactly the same depth that the first pulse did, or is it going to be a little bit less, um, or is it going to be a lot less? Um, and uh, so a paired pulse experiment is basically asking, um, depending on how I change in time uh, the, this pulse and where it, where it occurs relative to the first pulse, how does that change the current response? Um, and the reason you do this is because it tells you something about uh, the the recovery of um, of the dynamics of the the cell itself. So if we think about the fact that um, you know the dynamics of what's driving this is 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 a bunch of ion channels that's causing the muscle cell to change its uh, potential, then um, you know how fast or slow those ion channels are able to open or close is directly related to how fast it can recover if I do these two pulses you know, really close together. So this is essentially a way to get a sense of, of the dynamics of, of all the ion channels that are working all in mass um, to make this happen. So um, these different experiments basically, um, again, uh, as I was showing you before, this is one of those overlaid uh, pictures. So we're looking at the results of several experiments all done at once, all put together on a composite. And, um, and in this case, they've used different colors to show you um, the different links, uh, the, the different durations of this paired pulse. Um, so in this figure, the red is the, the shortest interval uh, possible, and then the orange is a little bit longer, and then yellow is a little bit longer, and then green, and then blue, and then until you get out to purple, where it's a very long uh, interval between these sort of paired pulse type things. So we've done one, and then we've done a second, and and um, the current response similarly is mapped out in the color um, of the arrow to show you as well. Um, so the arrow shows you where the stimulus is, and the trace shows you. Know, what it looked like in terms of recovering from that. So, um, um, and then the thing to note there, what's quantified down here in the picture below, is um, again using the same color code from red to purple. Um, this is showing you the fraction of the current that resulted, meaning they took uh, the, um, you know, how long this initial response was, the very first pulse. Um, you know, this looks like, what, like 50, 100, 150, like 180 or so picoamps, given this, the length of this little legend. And then they measured um, what the red length was, and maybe that's like 100 picoamps or 110 or something. Um, and then they just show the fraction of those. So they just the fraction of this over this, and then that's what they plot in, in this dot here. And so you can see from the way that the lengths of this looks over time that they get, um, you know, they get longer over time until they start to get closer and closer to um, recovering fully. But you can see that even after this period, which is, what, like, I don't know, uh, four or five seconds or something, um, this still doesn't go all the way back to um, the same height that the original one was. Um, so there's not a full 100% recovery even after this much time. So either it takes way longer or, I don't know, maybe something experiment kind of messed something up, I don't know. But, um, but the, as the data is showing that as the interval increases, um, it also recovers at, at this certain rate. And again, so electrophysiologists care about this not just to show that it does recover, but the time, the time scale in which it recovers shows you something about, again, about the dynamics. This obviously, this could be a linear relationship, but it's not. It, it kind of recovers in a, in a curve, and, and the, you know, the time constant associated with that recovery tells you something about the ion channels. And, um, this is, again, another experiment that you could hope to reproduce in a model. You could say, you could do these paired pulse experiments, you could stimulate in this paired pulse way, and you'd see, do we get, you know, do we get a recovery that looks like this? If not, then your ion channels are probably doing something different than what they do in the real, in the real uh, muscle cell. So questions about that, guys, or comments, or anything? Anybody? Okay. 
So just in terms of like you know muscle modeling, like this would be a very interesting experiment that we could actually create in our simulation. Um, and this would be a very interesting thing to actually do, where you take exactly the same time intervals uh, that you've got here and see if you can if you can reproduce this kind of a curve. Um, we could do that today, even before you even get to the synapse. Um, and so we've been working hard to see if we can even get you know to this point. And that that by the way has never been done. Uh, nobody has ever tried to make a, a, a model of, of C. elegans muscle that tries to reproduce this data, at least as far as I've seen. So um, that would be kind of a completely novel thing that uh, would be, you know, an advance. Okay, so now that's just kind of setting the ground for what happens with muscle. Now let's look at actually getting to the synapse itself. So the synapse is between the neuron and the muscle, as we saw before. But in this case, we're using optogenetics not to put the channels in the muscle cell, uh, but to put them actually in a neuron. And um, you can actually do this, you can actually put multiple um, light sensitive channels into the same animal because you can take advantage of, of using different ion channels that respond to different wavelengths of light. So you can actually have like two different LEDs stimulating the same worm and when you turn on the red it stimulates the neurons and when you stimulate and when you turn on the blue it stimulates the muscles. Or, as we're going to see in our experiment, you can actually do that so that you can pick different types of neurons. So a neuron that expresses um, you know, one kind of channel can be the one that has the acetylcholine neurotransmitter. A different uh, frequency of light could stimulate a neuron that has the GABA neurotransmitter. So these are two different kinds of chemicals that uh, the neuron will spritz onto the muscle. And, um, and, and so you can play with different, just different colors of light um, let you do different kinds of experiments. And we're going to see that here in this, in this paper as we go. So now we're just doing the same thing for muscle, but instead of the light simulating the muscle directly, the, the, um, we're still recording from the muscle, but we're stimulating, from, we're stimulating the neuron and we're seeing how the synapse of the neuron affects um, the muscle. And, uh, and I should point out that uh, in this picture, it looks like we've just got one neuron, um, but in fact, in the experiments, we're actually gonna, it's actually going to be um, about six or seven uh, six or seven neurons that are all stimulated at the same time because they can't go, they don't go neuron by neuron, but they can pick a whole family of neurons to put this into. So it's about six or seven that are going to be responsible for the traces uh, that we're seeing next. Okay, and here they are. So this is now the first experiment where they're looking at uh, what happens. So now here, um, so here we're talking about acetylcholine. So this is one family of motor neurons. Um, and, uh, and they're called this because that's the name of the chemical that they put across the synaptic cleft. And then over here we're looking at GABA motor neurons. And um, so uh, similarly to before, we've got um, a, a, a signal that shows us the um, stimulus, the stimulus trace. So here it's a little tiny little square, uh, square pulse. And then below we've got the current and, and uh, recording from the current. But in this case, we're talking about um, this stimulus going into the neuron. We're still recording for the muscle. So this is what the muscle does now uh, when you stimulate the neuron. And this is interesting um, because now this, we're actually looking at how does the muscle change as, as the result of the synapse between uh, the neuron and the muscle um, getting, getting stimulated. And you can see that it's, it's a bit slower than, um, than it was before. So in fact, we have to have this square pulse. It's at the end of the square pulse that we really, or probably maybe in like about halfway through in the middle, where it starts to have a big effect on uh, on the current of the muscle cell. Whereas when we looked before, right, when we had this impact, when we had when we we're stimulating the muscle directly, it was like boom. As soon as you turn the light on, boom, we had this current changing immediately, right? No pauses. But here you can see, wow, okay, it's it's obviously quite a bit later. Um, so in between, so the extra time that's made up is the result of um, you know, what we saw in this picture before, which was that, you know, the stimulus gets to the end, and then these little, um, these little uh, vesicles are going to fuse with the membrane, and then the um, neurotransmitter is going to flow, and then the ion channels are going to open up, and then uh, only after that point, we're going to get a point where the um, current is going to start to change across the, uh, across the membrane. So, um, so it's a different experiment. It's showing us a different current trace, but it matches with our intuitions of what, roughly speaking, you know, this should look like. So we can, surprisingly, we can learn a lot from this little simple little picture just based on the timing of, of how this looks. Um, the second trace here 
um, they're actually stimulating, they actually are doing electrical stimulations of the, um, of the neurons themselves. So um, they're showing the, the difference between doing it with light and stimulating the neurons um, with the electrode. So, they, so in this case, the, the experiment is slightly different. They've taken the probe and they've, uh, and they've got a probe that's actually on the neuron itself and not just on the, on the muscle. Um, but the, the point here is to show, like, you know, is stimulating the neuron the same, uh, is stimulating it with light the same or comparable to what happens if you were to stimulate it electrically or directly because optogenetics is kind of a new technique and they just wanted to show that, they just wanted to convince themselves that that works. And yes, in fact, it does. This one here, UNC13, is, uh, they name it this way, this sort of funky name, is, uh, is the name of, um, of essentially a, a genetic uh, sequence um, that uh, has a, uh, encodes for a special kind of a, a receptor um, on, the, on the muscle cell itself. And this is uh, showing a mutant that they uh, did an experiment on where they're doing exactly the same stuff over here, but in this case, the mutant can't, um, its muscle cells can't be stimulated by, uh, by the neurons. It doesn't have, it lacks the proper receptors to do that. And um, so they often do this in, in, in biological experiments to just kind of show very cleanly that um, the reason that you're seeing this deflection is because of the result of receptors on the muscle cell, meaning that this deflection is, you know, is, is um, you know, uh, w wouldn't be possible if it wasn't the neuron that's getting stimulated. This is important to show here because um, if you had a muscle cell and it didn't have the right receptors, but it was getting stimulated, then you might think, oh, actually what I'm looking at is, um, is what I saw before over here, which is that the light is actually just stimulating the muscle cell directly, um, but it's not. Um, in this case, in this particular experiment, the light isn't stimulating the muscle cell. The muscle cell isn't getting stimulated at all. Um, so it, it's proof that, in fact, it's happening over this, the synapse. It's not happening directly to the muscle cell without the synapse in the, in the loop. Does that make sense? OK. Yes, it does. All right, cool. All right, and then in this trace, um, we're doing the same thing. This is the um, photo stimulation, just like over here. So this is just like this first figure, except that um, we're doing it for a different class of motor neuron, the one that uh, uses GABA as its uh, neurotransmitter. And these are the two major types of uh, motor neurons that synapse onto uh, muscle cells in the, in the C. elegans. And um, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit faster. Um, so this is a 20 millisecond time scale. This is a 50 millisecond time scale. Um, and as you can see, it also is a little, is quite a bit uh, rougher. Uh, in terms of its uh, relaxation back uh, to zero, which is kind of interesting. Um, they don't really explain why that is. But, uh, but anyway, this that's shows... They, what's that? I was just curious. Is that something that's been seen in other C. elegans uh, responses, or is that... Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I, don't, I don't exactly know why that is. Um, you know, um, yeah, I, I haven't seen it myself. Um, someone who sure. might be more expert in this might... Uh, might know what that is, but uh, you know, you can conjecture that maybe neurotransmitter is kind of you know not taken up as quickly or something. But I, I really don't know why that's why that's happening. It is kind of an interesting thing, though. Um, they, oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Do they know the receptor, so they could do the similar experiment like they did with the 13 mutant? Uh, do they know the receptors? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think they could. They just, I think they could actually. Yeah, they could probably do that. Um, to prove that, yeah, and they may have actually, it's possible in the supplementals that they've, they've actually done that, they just didn't show it in here, um, but yeah, they probably would have wanted to do that just to demonstrate, just to convince themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, another thing that's interesting about this, by the way, is that um, we talk about uh, excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters in, uh, you know, in, in neurobiology a lot, like some neurons excite and some neurons uh, shut down. And uh, what's interesting about this is that, uh, in, that usually you think of GABA as an inhibitory neurotransmitter, that it generally shuts down the activity of the neighbor. But in this case, uh, the GABA neurotransmitter is not inhibiting the muscle cell. The GABA neurotransmitter is actually causing a stimulation um, in the same way that the acetylcholine is, which is traditionally thought of as an excitatory uh, neurotransmitter. And this is an important thing, that this is one of those things that like, you know, um, that neuroscientists know that, uh, you know, the general public doesn't often know, 
is that just because it's a GABA neurotransmitter, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be inhibitory. Um, what makes something inhibitory changes a lot depending on the cell type that you're talking about and even the given dynamics uh, of the moment. Like it might be inhibitory in one moment and then excitatory in a different moment depending on the state of the cell. So uh, in this case, both GABA and acetylcholine are actually stimulating the cell. Um, so yeah, uh, kind of a key point. Um, this is one of those things when you make really simple computational neuroscience models, um, you often just say if it's GABA, then I'm going to do a minus sign and I'm going to reduce activity. But you can't do that here. And in fact, if you do it, you're going to miss a really important factor of, of uh, the dynamics. Yeah. Good. Okay. So now, um, in these bottom three figures, we're just quantifying. Um, basically, what you see is examples here. So obviously, this is just showing you a single trace. Um, but in science, uh, we <laughs> one trace is not enough. Uh, so we generally collect multiple examples, and then we put error bars on things. So um, here, we're showing. So EPSC stands for um, postsynaptic current, um, uh, so the, the electrically stimulated postsynaptic current. Um, and uh, so in this case, we've got uh, the amplitude of nanoamps. So here we're just showing um, the difference between when we stimulate, um, just directly stimulate the motor neurons with electricity versus when we do it with light. And um, the point of this is just to show that they're um, really quite similar um, in terms of how, uh, you know, how much stimulus goes, so the, 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 how long it is at the initial stimulation, so the amplitude of that guy. And then the decay time um, has some difference, though, I guess, that they're pointing out. I um, actually don't remember how they explain the fact that there's some significant difference in the decay time, but I guess it's, it has something to do with, yeah, the, the relaxation of this guy as it goes back, uh, as it goes back to baseline. Um, think, anybody see that in the paper? Um, I think we're talking about uh, sort of channel rhodopsin itself um, yeah. and saying it has to uh, re-isomerize back to a different... State. Okay. I think. Okay. Uh, and then it eventually goes back to the same level. Is that? Uh, yeah. I mean, that is the. I mean, that is the that is the, that is the dynamics of it. Yeah. So it might be this might demonstrate that there is some, um, you know, that you are making a change to the neuron itself, and um, right, you basically added a bunch of ion channels that didn't exist. In this case, for the wild type, you're just stimulating with electrical. So um, I don't remember them making a lot of it. I don't think that it was a big problem, but um, it is important to show that. Did anybody else remember that? Yeah. OK, and then, and then this one is just showing the last part here, which is the example of this um, mutant that doesn't have the right receptors, and just showing very clearly that, yeah, after very, a lot of repeated experiments, it really just didn't didn't ever demonstrate a, a postsynaptic current, so definitely wasn't happening. Okay, good. So that's our first that's our first demonstration that that in fact you can put channels into the neurons, you can stimulate the muscle cell, and um, and it's more or less comparable to doing it electrically. All right, so now let's look at some other properties of the synapse. Um, in this figure, in this next figure in the paper. They, um, what they did is that they changed the intensity of the light. So they can make a pulse, um, and they can have the pulse be dim, or they can make, have the pulse be bright. Um, that's the main thing that they're changing throughout the course of this. And, um, and so the different colors that they have got these traces on, again, another overlaid trace um, picture. Um, they're showing multiple experiments, but um, the difference between the red and the black is that they've changed the intensity um, of, the, of the light. And they're doing it on the top figure here. They're doing it by stimulating the acetylcholine motor neuron. And in the bottom figure, they um, looks like they're stimulating the muscle directly. Um, and so, let's see. Um, so the difference is here that's kind of interesting. One thing that's kind of interesting I found about this figure is that the deflection of the muscle starts, seems to start kind of before uh, the light stimulation. And um, I think you know, I, I think the way that this gets explained in the analysis is that um, this is kind of the result of, um, you know, of, of, of the way that the analysis gets aggregated, that it doesn't actually technically start before, but um, that the traces kind of look like it starts before. Um, but uh, I find that a little bit, I find that a little bit strange. Um, obviously, reviewers didn't seem to worry about it too much, so I don't, I think that uh, it's probably not a big problem. But um, it might be that some light is actually slightly escaping before the pulse 
is actually being shown here, but it's a bit weird. But anyway, the major difference between these two that you can see is that in this case, when, you know, later on, when the light is stimulated, the muscle is actually uh, changing, and then earlier on here, it's, uh, you're stimulating the, the, the motor neuron, and then later, the muscle is, is uh, eventually responding. Um, but um, the purpose of showing this is to kind of demonstrate what is the difference when you are stimulating the neuron versus when you're stimulating the muscle directly, um, and, and, and how does that change in terms of um, the gradation of it. So, um, <clears throat> um, so let's see. Uh, the quantification of this is going to show you um, the ratio between how stimulated the muscle cell gets when it's coming in from uh, the, the synapse uh, in the circle and how stimulated the muscle cell gets when it's stimulated um, by the, when the muscle is being stimulated directly. And it's just going to show you the ratio of stimulation between those two. Um, as you can see in the first one, it's like at about 30%. Um, the y-axis here is showing, right, so, so these are in different scales. This is 500 picoamps, and this is 10 times less at 50 picoamps um, when you're stimulating it directly. So they are normalizing here for the fact that these are um, on different scales. Um, but then they're showing you um, that the, what's, what's the same here, again, with these different colors, is that the intensity of the light um, was kept uh, constant in these, in these cases. So they're sort of showing you um, how many, um, I guess, milliwatts per millimeter squared of light are being, uh, are being projected. So, um, and, then, and then what's shown here, and I'm sorry, I cut off the x-axis here, um, but this is uh, I over IMAX um, muscle that's on the bottom here. What it's showing you basically is that there's a linear relationship between, um, between these two kinds of stimulations. So what does that mean? That means that if I increase the light, you know, uh, 10%, I'm going to get 10% more stimulation in the muscle. Um, and, it's, and if I increase the light 10% on the synapse, I'm going to get 10% more on the muscle as well. So um, what this is, this is kind of showing, and it's also interesting, is something about the synapse, which is that the synapse pretty faithfully is reproducing a linear increase of stimulus coming into it uh, that's coming out into the muscle. And that's not, again... So that, that's not forgiven, right? It could be that uh, it's, um, you know, exponential. It could be that, or logarithmic, right? So it could be that every 10% actually has less of an impact on the muscle. It could be that every 10%, you know, you know is two times, three times, four times more impact on the muscle. But, but this is a key, you know, important thing, is that for every little bit more of stimulation that comes in from the neuron, we get that little bit more reflected in the muscle cell directly. Does that make sense? Questions on this? Okay, so yeah, um, and again, our, our synapse model needs to reproduce this. So our synapse model needs to basically have the ability to faithfully reproduce, you know, every little bit more stimulation coming in on the, on the, motor, neuron, on the motor neurons that project to it. Okay, this was an experiment as well that was, was kind of cool, which is demonstrating another aspect of optogenetics that's pretty awesome. So in addition to, so we, in the experiment that we originally saw, right, you can stimulate, um, you can put in ion channels that stimulate the neuron and um, excite the neuron, okay, and cause the neuron to get more excited. But um, uh, something called halo rhodopsin, as opposed to channel rhodopsin we were using before, halo rhodopsin is a special kind of ion channel that is actually inhibitory. So that means that when you turn on the light, this ion channel causes the memory potential to change in a way that inhibits the activity of the neuron. And that's shown here. Um, now, I need to explain a little bit about why this is so fuzzy. Um, so we're looking, uh, first of all, at a much longer time scale than we had been in some of the previous pictures um, of a second. And, um, and we're recording uh, from the muscle cell, again, as we normally do. But we see all these little, all these little deflections of current that are happening that are, that are rather fuzzy. Actually, we saw this in a previous picture. We saw this in this picture here when we're recording from muscle cell. You notice there are all this, all this fuzz. So this is a property of neurons. It's also pretty interesting. Um, we didn't talk about it before, um, but it's also something that like, neuroscientists know that not everybody knows. It's kind of cool. These things are called minis. Okay? And, a, and, and what a mini is, um, it sort of violates the traditional model of what you think about with, um, with uh, this picture here for the synapse. So here in this picture, what you see is that only when 
the stimulation comes to the end of um, the axon terminal, do you get any neurotransmitter release? Well, it was discovered not that long ago, probably in the last few decades, that, yeah, this does happen. But in addition, even when this is not getting stimulated, even when um, there's not an actual action potential, there's a little bit of neurotransmitter release that's happening even at baseline in certain neurons all the time, constantly. Um, and those, and that's what's called minis. So these little guys are the result of like five molecules of neurotransmitter coming across the cleft, or two molecules of neurotransmitter coming across the cleft, or you know, if a larger one, it's like ten molecules of neurotransmitter. They're kind of getting released in in a way that isn't related to a direct stimulation, as far as we know. Um, it's kind, they're kind of getting released, you know, casually, <laughs> if you will. Now maybe it's a result of the membrane potential changing. Um, on the, on the side of the neuron, or maybe it's just kind of getting tonically released, we don't know. But basically, this, is, this quality of minis is something that you can see when you're recording on the postsynaptic side and you're recording on the other side of the neuron, uh, of, the, of the synapse, I should say. And uh, it's kind of happening constantly. So in this first part of the, the, this fuzzy part, we're basically just recording at rest from the muscle cell, and this is what it sees from uh, the neuron on the other side, even if it's not being stimulated. And then they turn on the light, okay, on the, on, the, on the motor neuron, and that gets quieted down. Even though you can still see that there's some, there's still some minis that are occurring, um, it's a lot less. And it's a lot less frequent, and it's a lot less amplitude, and so the muscle cell isn't seeing that. But then afterwards, they turn it off again, it comes back, okay? And, um, and this is another interesting thing about the way the synapse works and the way that you can think about um, what a graded uh, synaptic potential is that's coming in from these um, motor neurons because um, if it's possible for this neuron to actually give less stimulation to uh, the muscle at a certain point in time, is it possible that the muscle is actually controlled not only by being more stimulated by being overstimulated and, and having a, you know, a greater uh, amount of stimulation coming into the motor neuron, but it's also possible that the muscle is controlled by having less stimulation that happens um, you know, normally. So we don't know. Um, this paper doesn't really speak to how that might work further up in the, um, in the um, neural network, but it's possible that, uh, that the muscle is both controlled by additional stimulation and also by the inhibition of these neurons. So, um, and that, this is this other thing that I was saying about GABA, right? So while acetylcholine and GABA both stimulate the muscle cell, um, it may be that this is the way that, um, you know, quote-unquote inhibition occurs for the, this muscle cell. It doesn't occur because there's an inhibitory neurotransmitter that's shutting down the activity of the muscle cell, but it may be that the motor neuron just quiets itself down and it's, it's stimulating the muscle cell less um, on the end of, uh, of yeah. So, so the motor neuron is doing less stimulation of the muscle cell even, that, even though during baseline it's stimulating it you know, at this amount. So this could be kind of a pseudo inhibition of a muscle cell, just basically lowering the amount of stimulation that's going to the muscle cell. Does that, does that make sense? Well, I have a... Um... So what do the minis actually mean then? What, are the, what is the function? Is it like noise or is it this uh, uh, incomplete uh, inhibition or something? Well, um, I mean, there's a whole literature <laughs> on, uh, on minis. So um, what do they mean? Um, you know, is, is a little unclear functionally here. Um, we, you know, we only work out basically from, you know, what we understand the dynamics are, which is that, if the muscle cell is, is going to be, if the muscle cell is getting more stimulus, then the muscle cell's um, membrane potential is, is going to have more current flowing through it at that time. And if it's getting less stimulated, then the, then the muscle cell is going to have less current that's flowing, th mm. flowing through it at a given time. So it's going to have an impact on the muscle cell, meaning that it's either more or less stimulated, but it's doing it in this graded, in this graded way. So it... Um, it, it could be, you know, and I think there's some discussion on this, that this is, you know, a kind of an analog control system for, uh, for the muscle cell. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's sort of unclear. The other thing is working out, like, why does the mini happen when it happens? Some call it, like, spontaneous release. 
So it's just kind of happening all the time, just kind of randomly, and that's just how it's set up. Um, the other is that it, this could reflect um, some activity that these motor neurons are receiving um, in the worm, uh, you know, because it is still alive during this experiment. So it could be that the motor neurons are getting little bits of impulses um, from other neurons, uh, and it's causing the neuron itself to get a little bit more stimulated. So we don't know that this is a completely disconnected neuron. Um, so, but they haven't teased apart how much of this is, is purely spontaneous and how much of it is like noise, like you said, in, in, in the neural network. Um, so it's just, you know, this is just showing you one little slice of, of, of what they're able to observe. They, they don't necessarily explain 100% about how, how that's resolved. But minis in general could, are basically thought of as being one component spontaneous, one component um, potentially noise in the, in the network. Um, okay, and then um, they're sort of quantifying both uh, the frequency of the minis and the amplitude of the minis, and they're showing you these three phases, the before, the during, and the after, and they're showing you that they happen a lot more frequently before, uh, well, actually happen a lot more frequently even after it comes back from release, which is interesting, um, and, but the during, um, they're much less frequent. Um, interestingly, they're also showing that the amplitude is more or less similar during, although you wouldn't know it from this particular trace, um, but I guess on average they are, um, and that's just the height of these guys as they're coming forward. So, um, yeah, so that's another interesting property. Um, and this is, this is um, I guess, less, this is showing kind of one order of function above the synapse itself, and it's just kind of showing that, like, you know, um, in our in our model, um, you know, we probably like most computational neuroscience models, PS, don't normally have minis, uh, or don't normally exhibit minis. Um, so they don't normally, you know, have this as a as a regular um, feature of uh, what's going on. But uh, but if we want to get something that's closer and closer to what the real um, nervous system does, then we should think about, you know, how can we create these minis, and you know, should our motor neurons basically have some spontaneous uh, activity in them? Uh, that can be shut down. Okay, so that's another interesting feature. Uh, were there any other questions on that? No, thanks. I actually, I'm sorry, but I actually have to catch a train, so I, I can't even <laughs> stay longer. Okay. All right. So we've hit the. Uh, we've already. We're <laughs> already been droning on for an hour, have I? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us, uh, Kadri. Really appreciate it. And yeah, uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> yep. And so we'll uh, we'll be in touch about next steps after this. Okay. Thanks. Bye. 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 -bye. Alrighty, so um, well, let's keep going, guys. All right, and um, let me just look here where we at. Um, okay, yeah. So we've only got uh, three more figures uh, to go through, and um, I think they're going to be pretty quick. So these are just looking at um, stimulating electrically versus stimulating with light, um, and um, and showing the differences in amplitude um, between the two. Just again to give give a sense of um, how the amplitudes are, are similar or different. Um, and we're doing it here. Um, oh, wait, sorry. I skipped one. I skipped one. Yeah, yeah. OK. Um, yeah, sorry. We'll get back to the electrical in a second. Um, here we're showing our right, trains of input um, uh, versus uh, continuous input and, uh, and the recovery. So um, as we looked at uh, in the very first one with the paired pulse, um, there can be a different kind of recovery time that happens when you change the interval between um, the first pulse and the second pulse, OK? Looking at spike trains is basically doing paired pulse, but all the time, like repeatedly in a, in a whole train. Um, so, um, so it's like kind of the next order of paired pulse and looking at dynamics one you know, order of magnitude above, above that and looking at the dynamics and recovery of that. So here, um, we're stimulating with a 10 hertz train of light pulses on the motor neurons. Um, and, uh, and we're looking at what the, what the current is over time. And so in addition to the paired pulse ratios changing from one to the next, it looks like there's another um, time course that happens as you leave the train on over time. Um, and that's uh, sort of a different result than if you just left the stimulus on uh, for the entire period of time. Um, and so here we're just looking at it qualitatively, and we're seeing that, yeah, so there's, there's more you know, high spikes that are happening here. Here, when we're leaving it on continuously, it's kind of looking more like we are sort of stimulating more, you know, more kind of minis that are coming out or something. Um, but uh, but these are definitely sort of different pictures. But but here it's it's what it looks like from the acetylcholine uh, motor neurons. Now, what's interesting 
is really the comparison between acetylcholine and the GABA motor neurons, the second type of motor neurons. Here, when you do the 10 hertz pulse, you get a lot larger uh, amplitude of, uh, of stimulus over here. Let's see, is that, um, yeah, two, it was, this here was 200 picoamps and 200 picoamps for photostimulation. Here, the height was fairly similar, but in this experiment, right, in the first one, yeah, and it's still 200 picoamps and 200 picoamps, right. So if you hadn't looked at the trains, you would have noticed that the first uh, current deflection looks the same for acetylcholine versus GABA, right? This is about the same, the same height here versus here, but on the repeated trains in GABA, they stay much higher than they do in acetylcholine. So the recovery dynamics of the receptors for GABA are different than the recovery dynamics for acetylcholine. Um, so that's actually quite interesting as well. Um, that they recover in a, in a, in a different way. Um, they, they sort of recover to a much higher amplitude um, and stay that way for longer. Um, and even in the continuous stimulation, there's much more sort of, of these, this mini activity that happens um, on the side of stimulating the GABA neurons than, than on the side of stimulating the acetylcholine neurons. Um, and this is just showing um, the recovery after a long period of time um, looking at uh, sort of a pulse for, uh, for one second and then looking 10 seconds in the future or doing it after a train and then looking after 10 seconds. So this is just one pulse and then a second pulse. This is a train and then a pulse and showing how that's different. I think this is probably the silicone example. Um, and then they're showing the, the different fractions. So, it's, so it does seem like there's some other process that's uh, some other time dynamical process of recovery that, uh, that we can observe when we're doing a train versus just doing the paired pulse stuff. And uh, if we do it just single, it's at this ratio of recovery. If we do a train, it's, it seems like it's much more exhausted even after 10 seconds and it doesn't recover uh, as much. Okay, um, so you're kind of getting the picture, like we're doing these different sort of time-based uh, experiments. Um, you know, we're getting these different properties out that we're seeing. Um, we'd, need, we'd want to reproduce these properties in our model, um, and, and they're just kind of showing some of these different features that are interesting. Um, in this case, they're um, doing trains, but they're doing them, uh, stimulating them electrically instead of doing the photostimulation to, again, show that it's equivalent doing it with the light versus doing it with the um, electrical stimulation. And this is just an example of, of what the electrical stimulation train um, looks like uh, as opposed to the one with uh, the pulses of light. Okay, and then the last figure is um, postsynaptic currents with different frequencies of neuron stimulation. Yeah, so in this case, they just did, uh, always did 10 hertz, and here they do 10 hertz and 20 hertz and 5 hertz and 1 hertz and 0.2 hertz, and uh, they're looking at the changes in the amplitude um, over time of the, of the, excite, of the excitatory uh, behavior. And uh, again, they notice that there's a difference between um, acetylcholine and GABA, so that the heights are... In, in, in the middle are much higher recovery, and that's the same um, um, when you stimulate it even at different frequencies. Um, so this is another bit of data, by the way, that uh, our model could try to reproduce, um, going through different stimulations and, um, and recovering at a similar kind of time scale. Um, and uh, in the last two figures of this, um, in, the, in these last two guys, um, they're showing individual traces, and I thought this was interesting too. So. Um, this, is, this is what a single uh, impulse looks like for the acetylcholine motor neurons and what a single impulse looks like for the GABA neurons. Up here, they actually had two other mutants that, um, uh, that uh, have different uh, kinds of acetylcholine receptors that are taken out. So in this case, um, so, so the UNC13 had no receptors uh, at all uh, for, I believe, acetylcholine. Um, but this one has like half of them or a certain complement of the acetylcholine receptors taken out. And this one has a different complement of the acetylcholine receptors taken out. And this is interesting too because it shows that there's actually these like two families of acetylcholine receptors that actually have different dynamics um, depending on how you look at them. And, uh, and that, the, and that uh, when you combine them together in the wild type, you get this um, kind of feature. So here it looks like there's like this fast, this family that has this fast impulse but then recovers immediately. And this one has this sort of fast, but then it kind of stays at a baseline over time and then only recovers after the stimulus is gone. And so if you look at this picture here and you kind of think about these two, it's kind of like this plus this, right? 
where this fast part is recovering, but then this slower component is hanging around. Okay, and so that's kind of interesting. And they didn't do that for GABA, but but uh, they kind of show this uh, put together. And this is a quantification of uh, looking at these three different mutants: the wild type by itself, and then these two families, kind of showing that there's a slow and and fast component. So we're working through different uh, ion channel receptors, uh, you know, like receptors, um, you know, that we would put into our model. Um, it's interesting to think about, you know, trying to dig out what exactly this ion channel is and see what where these dynamics are. Have a different family of of acetylcholine receptor channels that have this kind of uh, dynamics as well, and reproduce these two traces and see if we can sum them up to this. Okay, and that is the paper. So just real quick in four points to remind you where we started and where we got to. So uh, muscle cells are stimulated by neurotransmitter release at the synaptic cleft. We can use optogenetics to stimulate the muscle cells directly with light. Um, we can use optogenetics to stimulate neurons with light that then stimulate the muscle, so indirectly stimulate the, the muscle through the synapse. And then when we, we can either do pair pulse experiments or we can use repeated trains of stimulation. And these are going to provide us information on the dynamics of the synapse that we can use to uh, build a model on top of. OK. So guys, any discussion? Um, uh, yeah, if you, can, uh, if you can talk a little bit about how um, we're going to reproduce all of this. What's what's the pipeline going to be like in our um, in 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 our open worm simulations? Okay, good question. So how are we going to reproduce this? So I think the first the first thing to do is that we want to um, create these kinds of experiments that were done in this paper in simulation. And the way that we can create the first thing that we have to do to do that is to create these patterns of, of stimulation and, and patterns of recording. So they have very specific amounts of time that they, um, that they recorded from. And they have very specific uh, intervals, like for the paired pulse one, just for the very first paired pulse one. They have very specific intervals along which they did the first pulse and the second pulse. And then the data that came out, they have, like in that trace, they have a very specific target of what uh, the height of what the simulation should should look like. So um, the very first thing would just be to reproduce like the paired pulse experiment, and um, just the 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 simulation the stimulation pattern. Okay, and then run it against the muscle model as it is currently, and see what happens. And probably um, we're and, and turn that essentially into a unit test would be the next thing. So some way of of taking the result of the model um, as it comes out and comparing it with the data, the targets of the data what, of what are going to happen, basically saying, like, if the amplitude at this time point is within, you know, this range, then it passes. If uh, the amplitude in this point is, is not within this range, then it fails, okay? So the first thing is just to create this test harness. And, um, and then uh, as we're changing our our ion channels for the muscle cell, um, we're going to see if we're going to pass the, the paired pulse test or if we're going to fail the paired pulse test. Um, and initially, we're probably going to fail, um, but it's going to. But this um, suite of tests that we're building is going to be run every time we make a change in the dynamics of the individual ion channels. Separately from this, we're trying to make the ion channels themselves match what we know that the dynamics of the individual ion channels are, right? And then there's, there's tests around those individual ion channels. And the key leap that we're trying to make here, with just like the first figure of this, of this paper, is to see if, if, we can, if we can go from matching the ion channel dynamics individually to matching the cell dynamics um, in aggregate as a whole um, along this, this battery of tests. So now, um, how, do we get, how do we make them correct uh, is probably the next question. Like, how do we make it actually pass the tests? Um, so this is where um, basically machine learning and optimization uh, comes in to play. So um, in the first couple of muscle model um, you know, conversations, we looked at the Hodgkin-Huxley equations. And um, we know that there's a system of equations. And then there's all these parameters that go into those equations to set you know, how an individual ion channel is stimulated, um, how it, what its dynamics are, 
There are these different knobs that you can tune to get um, different uh, current voltage relationships. And so it, the problem is kind of under constrained when you're just trying to reproduce the IV curve. But now what we're doing is we're building a test suite so that when we change the ion channel, not only are we going to change the ion channel, but we're going to test the ion channel inside the cell. And, and in addition to, making, to matching the IV curve, which we can do, we're going to also look at all the sets of parameters that both match the IV curves for individual ion channels and cause this muscle cell to pass the tests of the muscle cell dynamics that, that we're seeing here. And then on top of that, to do the synapse, right, we're going to put in a model of the synapse, okay, that we initially think is about correct, and then we're going to build the test harness of the, the, the motor neurons that go in, and then we're going to play the same game. We're going to have the same uh, patterns of stimulation that, that this paper talks about going into the motor neurons with the light-sensitive channels. We're going to be virtually recording from the muscle cell on the other side of the synapse, and then we're going to create a test which says, yeah, yeah at this point of the trace of the muscle cell, we need to have this level of, of amplitude. And, uh, and then it's either going to pass or it's going to fail. And then again, when we're optimizing all the way even down at our ion channels, right, we can use the passing or failing of this test as a training signal to know that we need to change our parameters even further. So the idea is that, like, in biology, there's a lot of parameters, and things are very under-constrained. But when you have more and more requirements on the target behavior and dynamics that need to come out, that are these different orders of scale, there's the IV curve, there's the muscle cell aggregate with a bunch of different ion channels, and then there's the response to the synapse, right? When all those things are forced to be consistent, now the, the, we add all, a lot more constraints to where the variables can be. They can, only, they can be in fewer and fewer places. The, the values can only be in, in, in smaller and smaller parts of a very high dimensional space, meaning that they, you know, they to pass all these different uh, parts of the parameters. So by the time you know, we've gotten to the place where we've got these things tuned up, the parameters are much more likely to be, they're much better guess, right? They're, they're still an inference, right? But they're a much better inference because they've been built up from passing more and more and more and more tests. And eventually, we're, we want to go all the way out to having these muscle cells even pulling on the whole worm and creating the right worm behavior. And so that, even there, would be another test to even further confirm that our parameters are about right. So the idea is that there's only so many ways that these parameters can possibly change to pass all these tests that we're going to create um, to make this possible. So does that, does that make sense? Yep, it does. Uh, just one more question, and uh, that's um, only indirectly related to this conversation, that in lens, in our current uh, modeling paradigm, is there a difference between um, uh, optogenetically uh, stimulated um, cells and electrically stimulated cells? Um, so, good question. Those um, two different um, stimulation um, methods. Right. Is there a difference? Right. Um, so, um, so uh, LEMS, of course, is our NeuroML2 modeling language, and um, it's the thing that has the ways we define the cell itself and the ion channels and, and the stimulation parameter and all that. Um, so LEMS doesn't actually have optogenetic channels as such inside of it, but the key point that um, many of these figures were making was the similarity in many cases, except for that delay, so we didn't even look at that delay, but in most cases they're basically showing that uh, stimulating optogenetically is um, pretty much equivalent to stimulating electrically. And stimulating electrically is something that we can do in LEMS. So what we're, what we're saying essentially is that the, um, is that the equivalent amount of, uh, of light so, so a certain amount of light stimulation is, is equivalent to a certain amount of current injection into either the muscle or the neurons directly. So what we're going to do in our setting up our stimulation trains is that we're going to, uh, you know, you can go back in the paper and basically figure out for a given amount of, uh, for a given light pulse, like what that was equivalent to in terms of the current, the current that went in uh, to that. And, and then in the LEMS model, we're going to use the current. 
um, specifically. We're not going to do it in terms of in terms of light. We're just going to say like this amount of light maps to this amount of current. Another important thing, um, yeah. So so basically, every place where they were doing like the electrical comparison to the to the light comparison is one of those ways that we can kind of convince ourselves that that's a reasonable thing to do. Okay. Right. Okay. Cool. Other questions? How about how about Emma? How was this? How was this for you in terms of like getting brought up to speed with the uh, yeah yeah physiology? Does that did this stuff like make sense? Definitely. Um, I guess I don't know if Vahid is gonna bring up his question. He pasted a couple of things. Oh uh, oh oh the yeah. chat. Oh yes, so the stuff in chat. Uh, wow. Okay. Let me let me look let me look at okay. those the same those same questions. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so some questions from the chat. He says, according to this paper, show that unlike mammalian skeletal muscle APs, C. elegans muscle APs occur in spontaneous trains, do not require the function of postsynaptic receptors, and are all or none overshooting events rather than greater potentials have been previously reported, which cites this paper. Sorry, the interrupt someone in this paper. Okay, wait, hang on. Show that. According to this paper, unlike spontaneous. C. elegans muscle uh, action potentials occur in spontaneous trains, do not require the function of postsynaptic uh, receptors, and are all or none overshooting events rather than greater potentials. Okay, yes. So a couple things. Okay, yeah. Um, let, me, let me actually look at which paper this is. I think I know which one that is. Next section. <clears throat> yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, what this is saying is, 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 is a couple things. So the muscle cells, um, there, was a, there was a debate um, in the C. elegans field up, up until about five years ago as to whether or not the muscle cells had an action potential, meaning that they had an all or none uh, behavior, or whether the muscle cell uh, got you know more and more you know more and more stimulated or less and less stimulated, and um, and a re and a paper, the paper that that movie where I showed you the movie of the of the muscle cell being stimulated um, demonstrated it does have action potentials, uh, but the but the uh, but the neurons. So far, no one's shown that, that the neurons have action potentials. So the graded, so the muscle cell can still respond in a graded way, meaning that its its um, its membrane potential can go up a little bit more and a little bit more based on um, what it's receiving. At some point, it'll have an action potential and it'll spike, which is um, the data that we saw in the first two figures um, before. Let me actually go back. Um, so we saw here paper from Boyle and Cohen, right? So, um, well, actually, this is this is also not showing specifically an action potential, but anyway, it's showing more kind of spiky, spiky type behavior. Sorry, it's not showing an action potential at all. That was wrong. But um, but it does have action potentials, and the other paper shows them, and we could we could talk about that paper as well. Um, the other thing that you're saying is it doesn't require the function of postsynaptic receptors. Yes. So it's so we're showing one way in which the muscle cell gets stimulated, which is through this synapse from the motor neurons. But this statement that it doesn't require the function of postsynaptic receptors is right. So what's the other way that muscle cells can get stimulated? Well, there's, there's some evidence that muscle cells can stimulate each other through gap junctions. So, um, you know, they're all packed in. They're packed in next to each other in these little ringlets, and the, mu the muscle cells touch each other. And um, we know that there's actually little gap junctions where the muscle cells touch each other. So um, it's not strictly necessary to have the uh, motor neuron stimulate the muscle cell in order for the muscle cell to fire an action potential and for it to contract. Um, there are other ways in which it can, it, it can contract. But in this particular experiment, we're, we were focusing on that synapse. And so they weren't trying to make it get stimulated in some other way. But it is important to say, yeah, it is important to point out that, like, there are other ways to make the muscle cell go than just the neuromuscular um, junction, just that, just that synapse. Um, and what else? Then a, a recent study implied that motor neurons transmit signals in a graded fashion, right? That's what we're seeing here. C. elegans body wall muscle cells integrate graded neuronal inputs and use all or non electrical signals um, to coordinate muscle contraction and relaxation as well to drive locomotion. It has been recorded that graded action potentials occur in cell against body wall muscle cells, which is now rejected with recent studies. Yeah. So they, this is sort of illustrating the debate that's been going on. 
um, in here in, in, in this field. But but again, so graded graded inputs is what the neurons do. So the, so the neurons either go up or down. You can see to some extent with the minis that the mini frequency can change. So this is what's thought to be one aspect of um, of, of dynamic regulation, and that's over the course of seconds. And then you've also seen that stimulating a motor neuron with a pulse, that pulse can be seen in the muscle cell. And then this other part, this all or none electrical signals, that's the part where the muscle cell reaches a certain level of stimulation, where the muscle cell has a spike, and, um, and, and, it, and uh, that reaction probably causes you know, a big contraction, um, and uh, maybe it's the only thing that causes contraction. This particular paper doesn't really look at that. Um, and, uh, and that's how they sort of coordinate their, their behavior. And there had been a time, and this, this whole rejected by recent studies, right, it, it has been reported that graded action potentials occur in C. elegans body while muscle cells, which is now rejected with recent studies. So yeah, there's just this debate about whether the graded thing is what's driving the stimulation of the muscle cell. Um, and um, I guess basically they're saying that it's no, it's just like all or none action potentials that make that happen. But to some extent we're getting into like the part of the field where probably different scientists have different perspectives on. Um, this other, this paper that I got that uh, I cited here um, where that movie comes from I think is, was regarded as kind of the, the paper that proved that action potentials happen in, in muscle cells. Um, and yeah, so that should be an important part of our, of our model. Our model should have an all or none action potential behavior. Um, we need to make sure that that does occur. Um, the Boyle and Cohen paper uh, did not build it so that it had an action potential, actually, which is interesting. Um, they didn't have the data that showed that it was an all or none action potential. Um, so our model will need to evolve beyond where it is now to have all or none action potentials down the road. Um, but a lot of the work that we've been doing has just been trying to get even a framework to do that modeling. So that's why um, that's why we are where we are. Hopefully, that made sense to somebody who wasn't seeing what I was writing. Okay, so he has a clarification. Thank you. Good. Um, did you have a follow-on question, Emma, or were those basically what your questions were? No, I, I just I wanted to make sure those got seen. Good. Okay. Yeah, I was looking out of the Q and A um, uh, from other folks. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Okay, some, some folks are reporting that there were some pauses in the video. I'm sorry about that. I, were, did you guys see pauses here in the room? Were you guys? No. no? Okay. So if you were getting pauses out there, I'm sorry about that. Um, but I bet if you go look at the YouTube archive, um, you'll see it just fine. It doesn't seem like it was my problem with transmitting. So, uh, yeah, just go, just go watch the archive. It'll be up on the Open Room YouTube channel um, pretty soon after this. Um, we do a question from... Julian Vickers, does optogenetic stimulation not also allow you to achieve a finer grained method of testing different types of neuroreceptors as well? Um, uh, finer grained compared to what? I'm uh, not exactly sure. Um, it is, uh, obviously it's a very powerful tool uh, for uh, neuroscience in many different ways. Um, I'm also not exactly sure what you mean by testing different types of neuroreceptors. Um, but certainly, um, you know, the, the creativity that's happening right now with optogenetics uh, is, is vast. Um, so I think that um, there certainly are experiments that are, you know, huge improvements over what we were able to do before. Again, you know, the ability to, like, turn on one color of light and turn on a different color of light and stimulate, you know, whole different populations of, of neurons by doing that. You know, is just you could never stimulate them by putting in you know electrodes into all of those at the same time. So um, I mean, it's a huge improvement over what we were able to do before. So I guess I'd say probably yes. It's a it, it can achieve a finer grain method of testing different types of neuroreceptors um, in a way. Um, but uh, you know, it comes down to the specific experiment uh, that that does that. So uh, I hope that at least provides a clarification. Um, and let me just check real quick before I break if there are any other comments that are coming in from any of the other sources. No on YouTube. Let me just look at Twitter real quick. Yeah, let's see if anybody's asked anything over there. Uh, doesn't look like it. Okay. Cool. Uh, any last things from folks in the room? 
All right, guys. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us and uh, having a read of this paper. Hopefully this makes uh, some more sense. Um, um, so this is part of the new muscle neuron team. Uh, this paper is helping us better understand the dynamics of the muscle cell. If you were interested, um, uh, if you're watching and you're interested in joining us, please join our mailing list, openworm-discuss at Google Groups. Um, and uh, and uh, and also on GitHub with the Muscle Model Repository under Openworm, um, and we will be talking over the next several weeks about how to take this data from this paper and improve our model of the muscle cell and improve the model of the motor neurons that project to that muscle cell um, and uh, continue building from here. So thanks everybody and um, have a great weekend. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Cheers.